All right, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this week's Teen Kentucky Update. We have some great news on the economic development front to start today with. The Kentucky Economic Development Finance Authority has approved eight projects today. They represent $230 million in new investments in Kentucky, and they're going to create more than 370 new full-time jobs in the Commonwealth. A full rundown includes MGPI, who's making a $20 million investment in Grant County. Wuwan Technology, a $3.43 million investment in Hardin County. Southern Coil Solutions, $27 million investment in Warren County, creating 30 new jobs. Penny Royal Barrel Company in Adair County, $8.5 million investment, 10 new jobs. Aerospace Composite Solutions in Butler County, $16.8 million investment, 72 new jobs. Uh, and there are at least two more projects approved this morning that we're going to have some uh, specific news on. Bakery Express Midwest in Boone County, that's a $10 million investment with 175 new jobs. And Eastern Light Distilling in Rowan County, $143.7 million investment in the creation of 50 new jobs, including those projects that we are announcing today. Administration to date, we've seen over $26.8 billion in new investment in Kentucky and well over 47,000 new full-time jobs. As we look into the future, we also have bright news today with eight new site and building development projects that I'll announce for over $2.5 million in state funding. Let's focus on those two economic development announcements that we're going into more detail with. I'll start with a company creating at least 50 new jobs. And that's Eastern Light Distilling, which is constructing a $143.7 million facility in Rowan County. This startup distiller is introducing an innovative new concept that will grow the state's signature bourbon industry in Eastern Kentucky while supporting craft bourbon makers as a custom contract distiller. The locally owned venture is led by a couple of Kentucky bourbon industry veterans who have joined me here today. They are Caleb Kilburn, an internationally recognized master distiller, that is a great title, uh, and Cordell Lawrence, the company's CEO. Their plans for this project build on recent bourbon and spirits growth across Kentucky, which saw record investment and record job growth in 2022. Since the start of my administration, the Commonwealth spirits industry has had by far its most significant years of investment with 85 new location and expansion projects totaling well over $3 billion in advancements in, the, in investments in the creation of more than 1,500 new full-time jobs. Better still, this project represents a major success for our site and building development programs as, Rowan, as the Rowan County site that this is going to be on was approved for $600,000 through the Kentucky Product Development Initiative earlier this year. I want to congratulate Eastern Light Distilling on this announcement and wish them the very best in this new venture. Now I'd like to welcome up Cordell and Caleb to come up and say a few words about this incredible announcement. Gentlemen. Governor, welcome. thank you so much for the time and attention today. And very welcome. Thank you. Excited Thanks. to tell you all about this project. So first off, my name is Caleb Kilburn and I will be the master stiller of Eastern Light Distilling, located in Round County, Kentucky. Roughly 10 years ago, I left that community, one that raised me, one that educated me, and ultimately I had to leave due to a lack of opportunity. And I was fortunate enough to find that here in the Bluegrass at Kentucky Fearless Distilling Company. There I was able to work alongside some of the best men and women within this industry, and I learned and grew up so much. We achieved amazing things recreating and promoting one of America's amazing brands, telling the family story of the Taylors and how they were able to create this resurgence within their family and showcase this amazing brand. We achieved amazing things together. Well, as Coraldale and I went on, we found so many other craft distilleries, so many craft distillers who were suffering to find additional capacity, additional uh, resources to build their brands with. And it was based on that that we were able to find our opportunity to create Eastern Light Distilling, a distiller that will be solely focused on the enablement and growth of these craft brands. When it came time for us to locate and find a home, none was surer for me than Eastern Kentucky. 
it was one area that in the state that hasn't been able to share in Kentucky's bourbon success. I was able to work with state and local leadership in landing the project. Uh, and just a few brief thank yous uh, in the Cabinet for Economic Development. Jared Metz was instrumental in helping us to navigate the procedures to find some amazing incentive programs to help enable this project. Jason Sloan with the local chamber, who was instrumental in helping us navigate those processes, uh, working with the governor's office and helping to locate land and opportunity for us to build this distillery, as well as Judge Executive uh, Harry Clark and Director Emeritus Bob Helton all were so instrumental in creating this process. So a big thank you to all of you all in creating this opportunity for us. And another thank you I'd like to extend is to Corky Taylor, who's the owner and CEO of Kentucky Pearl Sicilian Company, an amazing man and amazing entrepreneur who has taught me so much. It is his style of compassionate leadership and entrepreneurship shaped in a way to benefit the world that I hope to emulate and I hope to follow. I may not be able to meet the whole world, but I'm gonna start with Eastern Kentucky. I'd like to introduce you Thank to you. CEO of our venture, Cordell Lawrence. Thank you, Caleb. And thank you, Governor Brashear, for your leadership and support. Without that, without the support of Jason Sloan and others, Jared Metz as well, who's joining us today, this project was merely a dream. Now this dream is realized in Eastern Kentucky. This is actually happening. We knew it would happen with the leadership at the local and state level from day one and we saw the need in this industry from day one. The dream of bringing Kentucky's time-honored bourbon industry to Eastern Kentucky is now realized. More than just a distillery, Eastern Light is a proud Kentucky-owned and operated business that will help bring new entrants into the state's signature bourbon industry. We will do that by supporting craft bourbon brands like never before, making our bourbon heritage accessible to more Kentuckians. And fortunately, we're utilizing the talent of the Master Distiller of the Year in 2023. He's very humble, but I have to mention that, of course. So Eastern Light Distilling marries bourbon and entrepreneurship, two things that have helped Kentucky flourish now and will in the future for generations to come. Caleb and I would like to extend a personal thank you to Corky Taylor, Carson Taylor, fourth and fifth generation owners of Kentucky Peerless Distilling Company, a globally recognized distillery actually named the Global Craft Producer of the Year just a few short years ago. Without that support, without that belief, without that opportunity to work together, this day would not be possible. We're grateful to Governor Bashir, local officials in Moorhead and Rowan County, and everyone that has supported us throughout this journey. Thank you all so much. Now, if you need one incredible example of what's happening in our economy, Caleb leaving where he is from because of lack of opportunity and now bringing that opportunity back so no one else will be in that position in, in the future. You're both building your company and helping us rebuild uh, parts of our state, ensuring that prosperity reaches all parts of Kentucky and absolutely no one is left out. So thank you, gentlemen. I also wanna highlight a project that's creating over 175 new jobs in Boone County. Bakery Express Midwest is a commercial uh, bakery manufacturing company that supplies its customers with fresh baked goods. The company is set to locate a new $10 million facility in Northern Kentucky to service the Commonwealth as well as Ohio, Indiana, and Tennessee. Founded in 1970, the Bakery Express family of companies provides fresh bakery products to over 4,000 retail outlets across the United States. I wanna congratulate the leadership at Bakery Express Midwest on their recent success and thank them for choosing to grow and invest in our Northern Kentucky region. The tremendous Eastern Light Distilling pro Project isn't the only news today related to our commitment in building new sites and developing them to be ready for business. Over the last few months, we've announced approvals in the initial round of Kentucky's product development initiative, uh, rolling out approximately $17 million in state funding for 30 sites and building development projects across the state. Those numbers include eight projects that were announced today for over $2.5 million in state funding to support economic growth and good paying jobs across eight sites in 11 counties. The projects that we're announcing today are in Caldwell, Henderson, Logan, Nicholas, and Trigg counties, two projects in Washington County, and a regional project in Lyon County that is in collaboration with Caldwell, Crittenden, Livingston, and Trigg counties. Logan County is providing an upgrade to a lift station to attract 
new industry. Washington County was approved for state funding split across two sites in the Washington County Commerce Center. Caldwell County will undertake a project to conduct an in-depth analysis of the topography located at the Princeton Industrial Park. Trigg County plans to construct a new wastewater pump station at the Interstate 24 Business Park. The local government in Nicholas County will acquire the Finfrock property to begin engineering and site improvements. The regional project led by Lyon County will conduct a floodplain analysis at Penny Ryle West Park Industrial Park and Henderson County is completing a site grading plan with an approximate 1 million square foot building pad at the Sandy Lee Watkins site. I'd like to share a brief message from, Henry, uh, from Henderson County Judge Executive Brad Schneider about the significance of this project. At least I think so. Hi, this is Henderson County Judge Executive Brad Schneider, and we want to express our sincere thank you to the Kentucky General Assembly, the Kentucky Economic Development Cabinet, and the Kentucky Association for Economic Developers and their partnership, along with Governor Bashir in creating the PDI program. Henderson County is going to take great advantage of a PDI grant that we received to develop the largest build ready pad in the state for industrial use, and that's going to be in our four star industrial park a million square foot build ready pad that would not have been possible without PDI. And we believe that that pad will put us in primary position to handle the next economic development project that comes our way. So thank you to everyone involved in PDI. It's gonna create jobs in Henderson County. The largest building pad in our state and by a wide margin. That's the type of forward looking vision that's gonna help communities across the state grow and succeed. Building these projects wouldn't be possible without a lot of partners, the Kentucky Association for Economic Development, as well as utility partners who help us evaluate these sites. Uh, this is a forward looking program that addressed the challenge that we recognized a couple of years ago that uh, our economic development is so hot, we're creating so many jobs, we're locating so many facilities that we were gonna run out of sites to put uh, new prospects on. This is using money to invest, to ensure we're ready for that next round and to continue the best economic role we have ever been on and make sure it continues into the future. All right, today we have more good economic news. We just secured a second credit rating increase from a major agency, this time S&P Global Ratings. The rating is a measure of the state's ability to pay our debts and the overall health of Kentucky's economy. This is a fantastic milestone for Team Kentucky as we show everyone that our economy is booming, our pension systems are strong, and our fiscal house is in order due to strong management and smart choices that put our people first. This rating increase benefits every Kentucky family because it means every taxpayer dollar goes further in important construction projects in our various communities. The agency said this upgrade reflects the state's commitment and execution of efforts to strengthen budgetary flexibility and long-term financial stability. The report also highlighted Kentucky's strong economic trends, emphasizing continued investment and job creation, especially in our auto industry. This is the second rating increase for Kentucky over the past two months. In May, we secured the first ever state level credit rating upgrade from Fitch's ratings. That was our first upgrade in 13 years. So it's been 13 years since we've gotten any credit upgrade from these major rating agencies. And we've now secured two over the last two months alone. I wanna make sure all Kentuckians know, especially our public employees, including law enforcement, social workers, educators, transportation workers, that my administration has now secured the longest stretch of fully funding pensions. We have also included nearly $1.2 billion in supplemental funding payments to three of our pension plans. And we have increased funding for retiree health liabilities. I'm proud that we're supporting the public employees that show up every single day to provide the vital services to all of our Kentucky families. Today is another good day for Team Kentucky. All right, but there's even more good news. Kentucky's real property tax rate has dropped now for the third year in a row. On July 1, it's gonna be decreasing to 11.4 cents per $100 of assessed value down 
from 11.5%. So your property tax rate, Kentuckians, is going down. The rate is based on the revenue generated from property taxes the previous year. If there's more than a 4% increase in that revenue from one year to the next, we get to reduce the property tax rate. This is going to put money back into people's pockets. It's a small change, but every dollar that families can save, especially when we're still dealing with inflation, is really important. I'm proud to be the governor that's now had an opportunity to both lower income and property taxes on our families. This is a special time with a booming economy and the ability uh, to ultimately lower these rates. But the good news continues. This one for our coal producing counties and towns. Since the start of my administration, I've advocated for all of our coal severance dollars to stay in coal producing communities. Our coal severance programs are funded by state taxes from on coal mining companies. So this money really belongs in the communities that are mining the coal. And I thought our coal severance program should reflect that. That's why in my first budget proposal, I recommended coal severance dollars stay in Kentucky's coal producing communities without any going to the general fund. And I will continue to advocate for that. But the good news today is with the fiscal year ending tomorrow, fiscal year 2023, Kentucky's coal severance programs will pay coal communities more than $74 million. That is almost double the amount that was paid out last year. And it is the most coal severance money going directly into our coal communities since 2013, the most that's gone to these counties in a decade. These dollars help local governments pay off debts, improve critical infrastructure, expand parks and trails, and improve projects that make Kentucky a better place for everyone to live. These funds will go to fiscal courts and municipalities across 29 coal producing counties. Uh, here's an example. From fiscal year 2022 to 2023, Letcher County is seeing an increase of $1.5 million. Think about it, a county that was hit so hard in the flooding is gonna see an extra one and a half million dollars. So we have a video from Letcher County Judge Executive Terry Adams to play today. Hello, I'm Letcher County Judge Executive Terry Adams. Letcher County was built on the back of our coal miners and our coal severance tax here in Letcher County is vital to us providing the services to the residents of Letcher County and is crucial to us going forward. And in the West, Union County is seeing an increase of nearly it all begins. six million. And in the West, Union County is seeing an increase of nearly six million dollars from fiscal year 2022 to 2023. We have some images uh, to show you how they're using these funds in that community to develop outdoor recreational spaces, improve emergency services, and help pay off certain debts. This year, I proposed 100% of coal severance funds go to coal communities. That means all the tax revenues would go back there and we should pay the debt service and administrative fees out of the general fund. Now the General Assembly did not adopt that, but we're still committed to fighting for it. You can expect that you'll see that in my next recommended budget. And just to close out what this means, um, most funding to these communities in a, in a decade, um, just think about the counties hit uh, by both flooding and tornadoes, the needs that they have right now. And here's some of the extra dollars that they're going to get compared to last year. Breathitt County is gonna see an increase of over $550,000. Floyd County, an increase of over $1.7 million. Hopkins County, an increase of over $4.167 million. Knott County, an increase of over $1.765 million. Muhlenberg, an increase of $2.36 million. Pike, an increase of $3.85 these are important dollars that are going to help these communities uh, to, to thrive, not just to survive, not just to lift themselves back up after what they have been through, but to march forward into what we believe are going to be years of prosperity that are going to reach every part of this state. Okay, so today I'm joined by Secretary Michael Adams to bring awareness to domestic violence and the work we're doing to stop it. We support survivors in bringing attention to this issue. If even one person in our state feels for, fears for their safety within their own home, it is one person too many. Domestic violence affects both men and women. 
The statistics are staggering in Kentucky, more than 45% of women, that's nearly one in two, and 35% of men experience intimate partner physical violence or rape in their lifetimes. As governor, but more important, as the dad of a son and a daughter, that is totally unacceptable. And we all ought to be committed um, to taking action, to making change, to every single Kentuckian's safety. As attorney general, I saw firsthand the suffering and long-term trauma experienced by children and families impacted by domestic violence and sexual assault. And we fought hard to protect and to seek justice for them. We increased investigations and arrests of human traffickers, and we charged a record number of child predators. We also made sure Kentucky would never have a rape kit backlog ever again. Then we created a cold case unit to seek justice by going after and indicting predators who had evaded charges for far too long. We were the first office in the nation to form a survivor's council so that individuals that have been through this trauma could help us get it right to do it in a trauma-informed way, and then to provide services to other people that are going through what they had been through. We launched Green Dot, a violence prevention program for bystanders, and we trained the entire Attorney General's office. As your governor, I've continued the fight to seek justice and healing for victims and survivors. I want Kentuckians to know that they have advocates working for them. They do in my administration and in Secretary Adams. We've awarded more than $104 million in grant funding to victim service agencies across the Commonwealth. We strengthened laws by defining class A and B felony incest as a violent offense and requiring offenders to serve longer sentences for committing those absolutely heinous crimes. I signed legislation that requires the Commonwealth to produce an annual report on domestic violence related data. That's going to enhance responses and prevention efforts from agencies, including law enforcement, courts, and service providers. And we expect the first report to be released tomorrow, Friday, June 30th. The reports can include data from 2022 with key findings such as number of arrests made for incidents involving domestic violence last year, number of emergency protective orders served by KSP, the amount of electronic JC3 forms filed, and the number of individuals who received services from one of uh, 0, uh, 05, 15 regional violence centers, as well as the number of calls received through that program. I'm eager to see what this report is going to provide. It'll be the first. And so in many ways, it'll be a baseline that we work from. But remember, when we look at these numbers year to year, we also want more people coming forward. And so we'll have to analyze them as they come, both in light of how are we doing to prevent it, but also how many people are willing to come forward to talk about it so that we can help them and those around them. Now we're taking another step as Senate Bill 79 becomes law today. This effort creates the Safe at Home program to be administered by Secretary of State Michael Adams. This effort will protect the residential address of survivors of domestic violence, human trafficking, stalking, sexual assault, rape, and other sexual crimes, as well as the address of those who reside in the same household as such victims. To gain this protection, the crime victim or the individual residing in the victim's household just needs to apply to Secretary Adams' office to have the address or addresses protected. The bill also requires state agencies to protect the designated address. The Secretary of State has issued emergency regulations to implement the law, and today I sign them uh, as emergency regulations. Secretary Adams, please join us to tell us a little bit more about this important program. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Governor. Very welcome. Good afternoon. A lot of good bills became law today. Let me tell you about one of them, which my office put together and was, uh, was sponsored by Senator Julie Rocky Adams. No relation. In this past session of the General Assembly, legislators of both parties came together across party lines to enact, and Governor Bashir signed Senate Bill 79, the Safe at Home Act. Kentucky has one of the highest rates of domestic violence in the nation. Even worse, government facilitates this through unnecessary publication of individuals' home addresses. When a victim of abuse decides to leave and find a safe place, often her abuser is able to find her, sometimes by learning her new location through easily accessible public records. The Safe at Home program replaces my office's existing address confidentiality program and improves on it in three ways. One, it allows survivors to have their addresses hidden when registering to vote, 
without having to get a protective order from a judge. The state capitol is then the listed voting address on public records, and only my office and the county clerk know their real addresses, where absentee ballots can then be sent so they can vote in safety. Two, survivors can use our capital address as an address of record, not just on the voter rolls, which are public, but on other public records as well, across various state and local agencies. This law brings our program in line with 38 other states that mask private addresses on public records for those at risk. Three, given how many survivors have to cross state lines to keep safe, we extend reciprocity and allow participants of other states' programs to easily join our program if they move here with a streamlined application process. Yes, this is an election year, I'm quite aware, but that is no reason that those of us in this building cannot come together across party lines to solve pressing problems and protect our most vulnerable. Our legislature did that, passing this law unanimously. So has Governor Bashir. Not only did he sign this law, his team has worked closely with my team on implementing this as quickly and effectively as possible. Today, he and I are signing emergency regulations to fully implement this law. I appreciate that good faith partnership. It serves Kentuckians well. Please stay tuned for more information from our office about the Safe at Home program. Governor, thank you very much. Thank you to Secretary Adams. Uh, let's remember we all have a role to create a brighter but also a safer future for our neighbors. Golden Rule tells us we love our neighbors as ourselves. Parable of the Good Samaritan says everyone, absolutely everyone, is our neighbor. We all must commit to protecting our fellow Kentuckians and standing with survivors of these heinous and cowardly acts. If you or someone you know needs assistance, I encourage you to reach out to the National Domestic Violence Hotline by calling 1-800-799-SAFE, or you can visit kcadv.org. We cannot and will not solve this crisis alone. Let's work together, everybody looking out for each other. Thank you all. All right, today we have another weather alert. It seems that we have this every week or even a couple times a week. Kentuckians need to remain weather aware today as we're experiencing severe weather, especially those in Western Kentucky. The strongest storm started to move through our western region this morning, but a second round could move east of I-65 later today. Heavy rainfall, damaging winds, and large hail is expected. We're also warning Kentuckians across the state of how hot it is. Index values could range from 104 to 115 degrees on top of the air quality concerns due to the Canadian wildfires. Please be aware and take precautions as needed. Cooling centers are an important resource during summer heat events and are especially critical for homeless individuals or those without adequate cooling in their home. For other programs, you can contact the Community Action Agency near you or dial 211. All right, sheltering from Eastern Kentucky, uh, now uh, down to 83 households. That's four less than our last update that remain in 86 travel trailers. 79 are on commercial locations, seven are on private sites. 299 households have now transitioned out of the program to more stable housing. We continue to see approvals in the FEMA buyout uh, program. Uh, that's FEMA Hazard Mitigation Property Acquisition Program. It's what we call the buyout program. Uh, that purchases property through FEMA funds that is in the flood zone to try to give people dollars they can use to move to a safer location. As of last week, we've received over $38 million in FEMA awards for the buyout program. Those are 222 properties from Perry County, the city of Jackson, Breathitt County, Letcher County, Knott County, and Floyd County. This is by far the fastest that this program has ever worked, um, to my knowledge, in the United States, and so we're grateful. Uh, today, we also have some news for Fleming Neon, which was uh, hit by that flooding. This week, we posted a request for bid for a multi-million dollar project in the city of Fleming Neon in Letcher County to stabilize hillsides where historic mine drainage now threatens a number of homes 
a road, and a city park. We've developed a plan to stabilize the area and redirect drainage by installing a series of steel reinforced concrete retaining walls. Newly constructed drains and earthworks will funnel the water to existing drains and convert currently unusable areas back into functioning yards, roads, and foundations. This will allow the citizens to keep their homes, businesses, and property without the fear of landslides. The site visit for interested contractors will be July the 13th. Bids will be open July the 28th. This is good news for a community that was hit really hard. The funding is through the abandoned mine land funds uh, or the bipartisan infrastructure law funds. To date, Kentucky's awarded more than $21 million in these types of funds to support our communities. This week, we also received some exciting news in the form of three grants, one of which is also going to help us prevent flooding in an area that flooded not once, but twice. That's the city of Jackson. These are all U.S. Department of Transportation grants. They total just over $33 million. The largest of the three is more than $21 million to the city of Jackson to stabilize and reinforce the Panbowl Lake Dam. Um, I've been to or have worked with individuals on this dam for the last two plus years. Uh, the first uh, flooding in, in 2021 in, in the city of Jackson, we were very concerned that we were going to have significant failure and it could wipe out an entire neighborhood. During the 2022, we actually had to evacuate all of the communities on the other side, believing that the dam would not hold. This is an earthen dam that has a road uh, on top of it. Uh, Kentucky State Police had to go through the communities with a loudspeaker and sirens, and the mayor of Jackson was doing the same thing. Laura was working hard um, at the same time. This is an incredibly important project that is going to create uh, safety for the individuals that live in that location, and especially for those neighborhoods of Jackson that we believe withstand uh, even the, the, the toughest things that Mother Nature can throw at us. We previously announced a $5.9 million contract had been awarded to stabilize and strengthen the dam impounding Panbowl Lake, and it carries Kentucky 15 through the city limits of Jackson. So it cuts off the city in times of flooding if it fails as well. With this new funding, we'll be able to greatly reduce the risk of further flooding in downtown Jackson and protect our citizens. All right, second big transportation grant was $8 million to the urban county government in Lexington to fix a longstanding problem with the railroad overpass on North Broadway. The third grant was for the city of Bellevue, $3.8 million to design a 20 mile multimodal transportation corridor along the Ohio River between Ludlow and Melbourne. Uh, last, the Barron River Area Development District was awarded $600,000 in a planning grant. It's gonna be used to inventory bike and pedestrian facilities in 10 counties and explore the feasibility of an interconnected greenway system uh, that families could enjoy. The project also includes development of complete street plans for Franklin, Scottsville, Glasgow, Russellville, and Tompkinsville. So exciting grants. Now the biggest grant that we received this week, we got to announce uh, on, on Monday, and then on Tuesday had uh, US Secretary of Commerce Gina Raimondo at Simmons to announce more than $1.1 billion of federal funds is coming to help us ultimately run internet and high-speed internet to every single Kentucky household and every single family. This goes into a program where we've already made the largest public investment uh, in broadband in the state's history. It's creating jobs. I think it's 80,000 households that we believe we're gonna impact from that first round. We have a second round of, of our program that is out right now reviewing proposals. And this 1.1 billion will come in on top of that. All of these are matched by the private sector. And so we're not talking about one, we're talking about two plus billion dollars uh, to, to impact the economics, uh, to, to get especially uh, broadband and high-speed internet in places where it's too expensive to run it. Uh, our goal here is big, every home, every business, we wanna hook up every part of Kentucky in the coming years. It is a very exciting grant. Uh, it's gonna let us do some special things. It's gonna help every single Kentuckian. And our last uh, uh, grant announcement is Federal Transit Administration grant funding. I'm excited to celebrate this week's announcement of 11.5 million in Federal Transit Administration funding to promote a better 
greener public transportation system for all Kentuckians. The money will do three things. First, it's gonna sponsor 10 rural transit agency projects that modernize bus and van fleets and upgrade transit equipment and facilities. Second, it's gonna provide reliable, accessible transportation in rural areas for Kentuckians who depend on them every day to get to work or to get to a doctor. And third, it's gonna promote a cleaner environment. The funding comes from the bipartisan infrastructure law. Remember that was um, uh, pushed and, and we had two yes votes on that from both Senator McConnell as well as Congressman Yarmouth. It's an additional $2.9 million funding coming from that piece. And when we put politics aside, like the two of those individuals did, we can do amazing things to improve the quality of Kentuckians' lives. The Kentucky Transportation Cabinet will distribute the funding to the following 10 rural transit agencies that serve 46 counties. The Bluegrass Community Action Partnership, the City of Maysville and Maysville Transit System, Daniel Boone Community Action Agencies, the Harlan Community Action Agency, Leslie Knott, Letcher and Perry Community Action Council, Licking Valley Community Action Program, Murray Calloway Transit Authority, Paducah Transit Authority, Penny Rile Allied Community Services, and Sandy Valley Transportation Services. All right, and finally today, we have not one, but two Team Kentucky All-Stars. The first is Berea College, which was just named one of money's best colleges in America for 2023. Even more amazing is that Berea College um, was one of only eight colleges across Southern states to receive a five-star rating in this survey. The ranking put them in line with schools named Brown and Duke and Princeton, or as they would say, it put those schools in line with Berea. Berea College is a really special school, giving students the opportunity to do work-study programs instead of paying tuition. Founded in 1855, the school is the first integrated co-educational college in the South. Now it's top-ranking liberal arts school that empowers students and enriches the entire Berea community. Congratulations to Berea College on this well-deserved and, and well-earned, hard-earned uh, accomplishment. You are one of our team Kentucky All-Stars. All right, in addition to Berea College, we have another special All-Star to honor today, which is Candy Atkinson. Candy Atkinson has served the people of Kentucky for 45 years working in state government, and she just announced her well-earned retirement. Her current role is with the Secretary of State's office. However, many Kentuckians will remember Candy from the pandemic. Each day, she stood in our Capitol Rotunda at 10 a.m. to honor the Kentucky lives lost by ringing a bell 120 times, once for each county. It was a meaningful gesture that meant a lot to me and so many others in the hallways, especially in the most difficult of times. She showed up every day to do it. And, and having been there, you could see how much it meant to her every day. People would come out, some would pray, some would watch, some would sit and, and watch. Uh, but it was just a moment uh, where she uh, lifted up not only the individuals in this capital, but I think all over the Commonwealth of Kentucky. Uh, this is her at the dedication to the COVID Memorial that we started with that practice that she began uh, to honor Kentuckians. So Candy, thank you for your service. Thank you for honoring your fellow Kentuckians. You are a true Team Kentucky All-Star. Congratulations on whatever comes next uh, in, in your path. All right, we'll move on to questions. We have two journalists in the room with us and three on the line. We'll start with the latex. I think we ought to start with Anna. So I wanted to ask you today, actually this morning it was announced that the Supreme Court has overturned affirmative action in post-secondary education. Um, I just wanted to get your opinion, both from like a legal perspective and as a leader of the state with a lot of colleges and universities, you know, how do you see this coming to be? I mean, you know, what do you think will end up ultimately happening? Well, obviously people are going to study uh, the opinion and and learn what what it does and does not allow. But personally, uh, I believe that the student bodies at our colleges and universities should reflect the diversity of our communities. A diverse student body prepares our students for a diverse world. And we know that there have been historic barriers to opportunity based on the color of an individual's skin. And education is one way, maybe the most powerful way that we address those historic barriers. Tom? Um, 
thinking Bill just uh, just became law today. The one on uh, sports wagering, drink. and I guess the horse racing commission is getting ready to, to promulgate their regulations. Are you involved in that process at all? Do you have any idea? Can you discuss the status of that? Well, I am thrilled at the speed at which sports betting is moving uh, to become uh, operational here in Kentucky. Uh, every single partner, every single uh, group that is going to have a part in this industry has been involved in the preparations. Uh, we set a very aggressive goal to have it up and running before the first game of the NFL season, and I believe we're on track to do that. In July, I believe the Horse Racing Commission, which is the group that governs um, and, and regulates uh, sports betting, will have a, a meeting and they will uh, vote on the first set of e-regs, emergency regulations that they would then send to me uh, to get this thing closer uh, to launch. You want the e-regs in place before uh, that first bet is made. We are active in every part of this. Uh, listen, our, our Horse Racing Commission is doing a great job all the partners are working in good faith, but the uh, governor's office is right there with them, uh, both uh, contributing substantively, but also reminding everyone each day that we have to get this done under that timetable. All right, we have Karen Czar on the line. Okay, we have Joe Sanka on the line. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to get your reaction to uh, the federal judge yesterday uh, in Kentucky striking down part of Senate Bill 150 dealing with uh, hormone treatment for transgender uh, youth in Kentucky. I uh, just wanted to get your reaction to that ruling. Well, the federal judge uh, ruled uh, what I believe that parents, parents have the legal right to make important and sometimes difficult medical decisions for their kids, that a parent should always be trusted to make medical decisions for their children, not government. Now, this is one where I believe in the rights of parents being a parent to do what's right for their kids. I certainly believe that. Daniel Cameron doesn't. All right, next, I think we've got somebody from WDKY. Hey, Governor, it's Mark Glover with Fox 56 in Lexington. Thanks very much for your time. I still wanted to, to bring back to the uh, affirmative action ruling today. And there's some uh, discussion in trying to decipher it yet. How do schools find race neutral alternatives to promote diversity at, at, at colleges and universities? I mean, you indicate obviously that it's important to you, but I mean, what is a way forward based on your understanding of the issue uh, and how uh, race neutral alternatives uh, can be uh, uh, instituted uh, after this ruling? Well, that's the question that all of our colleges and universities are asking themselves today as they pour through that opinion. And, and I think it'll take uh, some time. Uh, before those universities come forward uh, with their individual uh, action plans. I still, though, believe in my core that a diverse student body prepares us for a diverse world. I mean, we live in a world uh, with people from different backgrounds and different experiences, and part of our education ought to be um, being together, trying to learn to understand people that have had different experiences growing up than you have. And I believe that when we have seen um, historic inequalities, oftentimes or especially in education, you now it's important that, that we don't forget that and we don't ignore that and we do our best in, in the ways that we can to address it. Okay. That is our last question today. I wanna to say happy 4th of July to everyone. There will be no update next week. That's everybody's 4th of July present from this administration. Thank you all very much.